we have Kenneth Wrights talking about documentation at scale. Hi, everybody. Ooh, sorry about that. How are you guys doing today? All right, we're good to go? All right, cool. Hello, my name is Kenneth Wrights, and you can follow me at Twitter at, at Kenneth Wrights if you'd like. And I work for a company called Heroku. Uh, we are a web application deployment company. Uh, you can come talk to me about that afterwards if you like. I think we're the best place to run at web applications. I'm also a member of the Python Software Foundation. I'm an active member of the Python community. I also think we're the best uh, software uh, community around. So if you can also talk to me about that afterwards if you'd like. <laughs> Um, if you know uh, who I am, it's probably from my open source work that I've done. Um, I'm an active member in the Python community, like I said. Um, if you go to my GitHub profile, uh, you'll see about 18 serious projects there, about 100 experiments. Um, I did this project called OSX GCC Installer, which is pretty popular, and it allows you to install um, GCC on your Mac without installing Xcode, which is pretty awesome. And I have this project called Requests, which is a Python library, which allows you to uh, make HTTP requests in Python, because it's really hard to do with the standard library. And that seems to be pretty popular as well. I also have a lot of other interests. I'm a street photographer. I like music. And I speak at a lot of events and other things. So. I'm going to be speaking about something that I normally don't talk about at all, um, and usually I do technical talks, and this is going to be a pretty untechnical talk, because I, I guess there's a, how many people here do, how many people here are writers in the audience? Yeah, so this is like a very different audience for me than usual, so I thought I'd try to do a little bit of a different talk than usual, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so basically, a um, little bit of, a, I guess, a history lesson in my view of the way language works. Um, so basically what we have here is uh, early humans. And uh, the way we started out, before we could verbally talk to each other, uh, we were just kind of sitting alone. And uh, you know, we had each other, and you know, we worked, we had this tribal nature. And, but we were just kind of alone with ourselves and our ideas. So our mental landscape was just kind of comprised of ourselves. And that was it. And eventually, we started developing spoken language, which was very key for us. If you go look at all these uh, other animals, we don't have that. Um, this kind of separates us from a lot of them. Um, and this allows us to express our ideas, which is very key. And then we develop this other skill, which is written language. And this allows us to persist our ideas over time. Uh, and this is something that, which is basically what documentation is which is very important. Our software really hasn't, I mean, our hardware hasn't really changed as we develop these different skills, um, but our software has been upgraded, basically. Uh, as we've learned to do all these different things, we've been going through, um, you know, we've been learning from our past generations, and, uh, you know, we built, stand on the shoulders of giants, basically. And we've been going through different st stages of communication. So it started off as a one-to-one -one communication. So at first, language was used um, for a single person, basically, to communicate to another single person uh, or a small group of people. And we still do this all the time. You know, this is how probably primary mode of communication all the time. But in the past, this was the only option that we had for communication, especially when it came to written communication. It was the only thing you could possibly do. This is no longer the case. So in the earliest forms of written, written uh, communication, this was what you had. This is a letter. Um, it's a historically significant letter. I can't remember the story behind it. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Um, this is one of the earliest uh, alphabetic uh, glyph languages that we have. And this was a literal letter that was sent to someone claim uh, about the death of someone's son. Um, so this is like what you would receive in the mail, essentially. <laughs> Someone would, you know, deliver this to you. I just think it's the most amazing looking thing in the world. Can you imagine receiving that and being able to decipher that? It looks like total, it's the most ridiculous thing. But it's amazing. So as we evolved um, our ability to communicate with each other, uh, we, have, we learned to do one-to-many 
um, which is something that we're all very familiar with and that past generations just before us are very familiar with. Um, so there, there was the uh, invention of the printing press in particular, which really made this possible and uh, which kind of gave um, the ability for either a single person or a single group of people to be able to communicate to an extremely large group of people. Um, so newspapers, books, televisions, radios, uh, this gave kind of this idea of a public, you know, this, this large group of people, this narrative that, you know, there's a, there's a group of people that aren't the people immediately around me, the people that I know. Uh, there's, there's this public, right? And, uh, you know, this is kind of polarizing. A lot of people, if you look at these different medias, there's some, uh, a lot of people associate a lot of bad things with TV and radio, but, uh, you know, often this can have a lot of good and bad effects. If you look at the next step, there's uh, many to many. Uh, if you're a developer, you know, you're building a lot of these things. You have one to one relationships, you have one to many. If you have many to many, that's obviously the next step. Can anybody guess what uh, many to many is in our world? That's right, it's the internet. So, many to many is basically changes and blows off the doors of everything in our communication system. Uh, if you have access to the internet, you have access to a universe of information and ideas, and this changes everything. Anyone can publish anything uh, to any number of people, large or small, and it's a completely level playing field. And the implications of this are tremendous. So just like before, uh, where you could, you know, we, where we were learning how to communicate uh, with ourselves and with others, and we were learning how to tr persist things over time, now we can persist things over space. So n now we can communicate with people all over the world uh, instantly. It's amazing. And when you do that, when you have the internet, you can navigate this entire sphere all the time without any, uh, you know, nothing stopping you from learning anything you want. You can go and you can go learn about self-identity, self-expression, culture, history. As long as you have access to it, you can learn anything you want. And there's all these different platforms that allow this and give you the ability to do this. You have social media that allows you to explore culture. You have creation and publishing tools for self-expression. You have consumption and discovery tools for self-identity. And you have research and information tools for history. So when you're going to explore um, other people or other pe uh, everything else, Wikipedia is a wonderful tool. It's this place where all the world's canonical information is stored and curated and documented. And uh, it's this amazing place. But at the other side of the coin, there's this, we need to have a place where we all go to document us, basically. And this is something that I think people need to think a lot about. You know. Wikipedia is it's canonical. It's like if you go and you add a random document about your perspective on something, it's going to get, you know, citation needed. It's going to get deleted. It's going to get erased. And I think there needs to be a lot of tools available to give us the ability to, um, to basically, you know, do the same thing, but for, you know, for our perspective, for everyone who's in this room, if we wanted to have a collective, do, you know, document of that experience. To, do, to share that and to document it. And it turns out we do have this, this technology and we can do this right now. It's pretty awesome. It's called documentation. <laughs> and we need to do it. We need to write the docs. Information, it turns out, is extremely powerful. We see it every day and it transforms the world around us. Documentation, though, it doesn't have to be only about technology. It doesn't have to be about software workflow or an open source project. It can be used to develop and convey ideas much larger than yourself. It, documentation is extremely powerful, not, not only because of the way it works, but just because it has information architecture inherent inside of it. And it's a very powerful tool for developing ideas over time. It enables us to evolve and distill information at a much larger scale than a single person or team could ever achieve on their own. This is extremely helpful when you have distributed people all over the world. And because of the way open source software works, which is often the type of, dis, um, of d documentation that I work with normally, um, you know, this allows people to work on something um, 
much larger than themselves. It works perfectly because you have thousands of people all over the world working at random, from random cultures and random time zones, all contributing to projects for different motivations, and it all come together and it just works, and it's great. But why are we only doing this with technology? Why are we only doing this with code? Why can't we do this with ideas, with prose, with language? This is something that documentation is perfect for. We should be doing this with everything, in my opinion. So for the first time in human history, we have the technology to make this happen. And this is something that I think we should all be doing. I think everyone in this room has the ability to do this. I think if you look at the, the trajectory of what we've been trying to be building as humans, you know, we, everything that we've been working towards has been to enable this type of collaboration. And we finally have it. You know, the technology is here. And it's exciting. We have the tools right now. So if you use something like read the docs, and GitHub pull requests. You can get instant version control documentation that anyone in the world can read and contribute to instantly. It's hosted for free. Um, the software development community seems to be a test bed. Um, and uh, it's just incredible. So pythonguide.org is a site that I run. And it uses this workflow, basically. Uh, it's continually updated by about 156 people at the moment. And about 50,000 people view it every month. And this works really well. Uh, basically, what I did one day is I sat down and I architected the whole project and I had an outline of all the different sections, some things that I don't know anything about, but I knew that they needed to be in there in this big, giant uh, hierarchy for the information architecture. And uh, I treated it just like an open source project. And I put it out there, I announced it, I filled in the sections that I, was, I knew and that I had time to do, and then um, people just started sending in pull requests. And uh, it worked out really, really well. So, you know, for, for me, I work on open source all the time, so this doesn't really seem like that big of a deal. But to a commoner, to an average person, having a book that's written by 156 people from all over the world, updated daily, tra transparently curated by an author, requiring zero time to publish, and available globally within seconds, is like the most revolutionary idea in the world. And it's something that we need to like really put a lot of time and energy behind and trying to make that accessible to everybody else. Because this is something that has only been possible in the last 10 years, in the last five years, and something that you know, only to us developers has been available in the last two or three years. So that's something that I think we need to put a lot of time and effort and energy into. So go write some docs. <laughs> go and make some repos that contain only prose, no code at all. Go start building some ideas with others, not just yourself, or just yourself. Topics don't need to be technical. You can build docs on philosophy, humanities, literature, arts, sciences, poetry, everything. And if you're a developer, go build some tools. There needs to be a lot of competition in this space, and there's a lot of room to grow. Restructured text, which is what Write the Docs uses, um, is amazing. Or Read the Docs, sorry. Um, but it's quite unapproachable for, for most people. And uh, the same applies to Git and GitHub. So there's a lot of work to be done. And if you're going, you can start building these things. Uh, you can look at this little diagram that I wrote, and you can think about different areas that we can go and expand in. For example, if you want to think about space, um, you know, internationalization is a big thing to think about in your tooling. Um, be cordial policy. There's a lot of different people that come from very different backgrounds from you that are not from your local region. Um, and you can have a contribution guide from people who aren't from your area. Uh, time is a really big one that people don't think about a lot. Um, persistent archiving, what it's going to happen in 100 years or in five years. If you get hit by a truck today, you know, what's going to happen to this project, to, to the code that you're writing or to the, um, you know, to the documentation that you're writing today? You, do you have a mechanism in place so that someone else could take it over or so that the hosting bills get paid? Um, these are definitely things that need to be considered. So anyway. The world is made of language. Become the author. Write the docs. Thank you, Kenneth. Uh, we have time for like one or two questions, if anyone has them. You have a question? Cool. 
Hey, so thanks for the talk. It was e excellent. But um, so I'm a huge fan of Python request documentation. It has a great narrative style, and it's really pleasant to read. Thank but you. I'm curious with like the Hitchhiker's Guide that you've been doing for Python. If you have lots of contributors, how do you like define your narrative voice? How do you find like if you have lots of people contributing sections, how do you maintain tone and style and friendliness? It's definitely one of the more difficult parts of the project, um, and it's something that I haven't dedicated enough time to. So basically, I wrote the initial um, structure of the guide, and I've, my policy has been mostly to merge anything that doesn't stand out as not belonging. And then my plan has been to like dedicate a weekend eventually to kind of refactor the entire thing, uh, or more like a month probably <laughs> to do so. Um, and, but we do have a style guide. Uh, in which I do try to, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I mentioned voice in there, I'll have to look, but it definitely should if it doesn't. Um, but that's, that's a big part, documenting that process and documenting the voice and documenting um, all those little things is I think the proper answer to that, but I'm not sure if I'm doing that. Anyone else? All right, last question. Do you have a process for review of the pull request? Uh, so at the moment, basically, I receive most of them and I respond to them quite quickly. But something that I do with a lot of my projects is I have uh, these minions, as I call them, and they help they help me out because uh, often you know I'm traveling a lot and I have a lot of I uh, sometimes the pull requests will become too great on some of the projects. Where it'll be like you know eight of them every day sometimes. Um, so I actually have some trusted contributors and they've kind of watched me code watch me for a while and they're aware of what my responses would be and uh, they will respond as I would basically. And that uh, works really well. So, cause there's a, a time limiting factor there. So, um, so like for the request project, there's, um, I have Corey and Ian and they're incredible. And uh, basically what happens is whenever there's a new issue that comes in to, uh, to my main projects, they will instantly respond far quicker than I ever could. Um, and then basically every, you know, whenever I get an opportunity, I just ask them for updates and then I'll, uh, I'll go to them and do that. It's all about, you know, if, if you need to step out of the way, if you're slowing the project down to, to do that. Um, but not, not doing that too early, obviously. So recognizing when you're slowing things down is really important. Thank you, Kenneth. Yeah.